Okay, everyone, good evening, and thank you for joining us here in this uh, midweek virtual Shabbat Shuvah Drasha. And the title this year is, Are We Inherently Good or Bad? And uh, without trying to explain how we get to this topic, let me explain by sharing some of the some of the slides. So we begin with the Yom Kippur Machsa. So on uh, Sunday night, Monday, Yom Kippur can roll around. And we will um, be saying the Vidui at the end of the Amida five times, and with the chazan repetition, ten times altogether. So this is a passage near the, near the end of the confession, near the video section that we say at the end of the Shemona Esri, the end of the silent Amida. It might be familiar for some from the years past. We read as follows. Elokai, God, we open the prayer. We say, before I was created, I was un unworthy. The idea that we're not worthy to be created. And now that I am indeed have been created, we are a living being. It's, you know, it's, so it's been better had I not been created. Because I'm dust in my life. All the more so after my life has ended in my death, I will be just the dust of the earth. Behold, I am before you like a vessel filled with shame. So this is quite a powerful and a, um, in a way, demoralizing type of prayer. I guess having confessed all our sins, come to God and given Him the whole list of our wrongdoings, and we come face to face with our shortcomings, our failures, what our lives really stack up to, I guess it's quite a frank um, admission that perhaps we're not really worth it, that our, our lives don't warrant our existence. And this is this is the this is the statement. And really, the important here, I think, at the end, in terms of the context of the confession, is Behold, this recognition of my worth and you know my worthiness to be a living uh, human fills me with shame. And shame is itself. We discussed actually last year over this season. I discussed the topic of shame. I think I spoke on Rosh Hashanah about shame. Shame is an important um, emotion and an important stepping stone on the on the path to repentance. So once we're full of shame, can we really start to come to grips with our shortcomings? This passage that we part of the Yom Kippur um, liturgy is actually very closely linked to a Gemara in Erevin. And the Gemara in Erevin tells us as follows. And it's really a, a important um, sugya, important topic in Gemara, discussing the age-old dispute, dispute and um, you know loggerheads between the Beit Shammai and Beit these two schools of of rabbinic uh, two school, rabbinic schools. Um, and the Gemara, they actually, this is the sugya that deals with how they came to Paskin generally, like the Eitz Hillel. At the end of that sugya, after various halachic discussions. The Gemara tells us about one final, more philosophical, theological discussion. Tonu Rabon, for the rabbis taught us, for two and a half years, the schools of Shammai and the school of Hillel were at loggerheads, were disputing one to the other. There were those who said, one school of thought said, would have been better that man had not been created, that God had never created the human race, than having created them. The Halalu Omrim and the other school said, no. No, it's better. It's correct that God created mankind and had he not created mankind. So they're discussing basically, is the human race a worthy enterprise? Was it a good move? Did God do right? Was it, did it pan out the, you know, it, to be a positive thing that man created, that God created man? Nimnuvagom, interesting here, they came to a consensus and they agreed. They actually go like Beishamai. The commentators say Beishamai are the ones who said, had it been better had man not been created. Not the topic for tonight, but generally there is um, the dispute between, sorry, oh, sorry. I noticed someone's um, put something in the chat. Um, the questions are, yeah, I see Josh has put the source on the chat. Thank you for that. Generally, there's a the discussion between the house of Beishamah and the house of Hillel. Um, there are those who explain it uh, as a, a typological di dispute that often Beishamah take a more high-minded approach. They take the approach of the world as it ought to be. For instance, 
um, when it comes to the dispute about how to light Hanukkah candles. So famously, they tell of the opinion we follow, you start with one candle and we proceed each night to add a candle. And by the eighth night of Hanukkah to express the miracle that the, 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 the oil and the Bet HaMikdosh lasted for eight days, therefore we have eight, eight candles on the last night. The Shammai, on the other hand, are, are, say it's the opposite. You start with eight lights, and you, you proceed down to one light. Many understand the, uh, the dispute as being as follows. The Shammai see and, and perceive the world from the, from the perspective of potential. So for them, the miracle was the greatest when on the first night of Hanukkah. Because in that little bit of oil that they had to kindle the menorah and the Bet HaMikdash with, in that little bit of oil had, at, we now know, we know, retrospectively know, lay the potential for eight days of, 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 of burning. Meaning by the last night of Hanukkah, the fact that they had burned for eight nights wasn't a bit, in a way, less of a miracle in that, from that perspective. Because that little bit of oil anyway should last one night. So Beg Shammai sees the world from the perspective of the potential, the world that ought to, to be, the world in its most pristine state. And they still are the opposite. They say, no, when was the miracle of Hanukkah most manifest? When was the miracle most, uh, you know, uh, most uh, manifestly you know, expressing itself. And that was on the eighth night. But after eight nights, they had actually burned for that long. And that's he says, we light one candle each time. So the Beisham sees the world from a more practical, from a more, the world as it is perspective. So hence, from, you know, one way of understanding this Gemara is Beit Shammai from the world of, the world that ought to be correct. From Beit Shammai's perspective, very few people can live up to the high expectations, can live a perfected, uh, perfected life. And therefore, he's the opinion that says, better had Ben not been created. Hillel, who's more forgiving. Hillel, who's more understanding of human frailty, who see the world as it is, the world in actuality. He's the opinion here who say, no, it's better for man had been created. Interestingly enough, even though we follow usually the opinion of Beth Hillel, here we seem to, the Gemara seems to say they concluded according to the opinion of Beit Shammai, that what, it would be better for man not to have been created. Now that man is created, well, it's a reality. We're here, we're alive. The, we, you know, the human species is on the face of the earth. We as individuals are alive and kicking here today, living um, beings. Therefore, what should we do? Let's do the best we can. Meaning, Probably in the grand scheme of things, better had we not been here. We're doing a bad job of a job, bad job of things. But now that we are here, well, let's try and improve it. Let's not give up hope. Let's not just, you know, say, well, nothing matters anymore. You fash me from myself. That's very apropos for this time of year, the introspective time of the Jewish calendar. You fash me from myself. I'm really awesome. So you mash me from myself. Okay, this is not an important distinction. In the exact nature of the introspection. But what's gleaned from this Gemara, and this Gemara is, is used as a proof text. The idea that it had been better for man not to have been created. Seemingly what this Gemara is, is, is inferring, is telling us that humankind is do doomed in a certain sense. That we as human beings are prone to failure. That we're prone to not living up to the expectations that God has for us. We're prone to doing worse than doing, than doing, than doing good. Which comes back to our topic is, are we inherently good or are we inherently bad? This passage in the Talmud seems to indicate that humans are inherently bad. And that's why, you know, taken from a macro level, are humankind going to do better or worse? Are we going to be worthy of our creation, of our existence? And this more seems to denote, you know, everything left, everything left uh, to itself, human beings are going to be bad maybe indicating that we are somewhat inherently bad. Okay, that's the Gemara here in Erebus. Why did I think to give this share? So I'll tell you really what, what, um, what stoked the thought process for this topic and, this, and, and these sources uh, was a book I was reading this summer. Some of you, I know I mentioned it once or twice before. This is a book called Humankind, you'll see on the, on the, on the slides, a, by a young a, um, um, Dutch uh, and a philosopher, a thinker, economist, you know, public intellectual, we'll call him. He was recently at Davos. He's been on, uh, I think it was on Newsnight um, uh, recently, or, or the Andrew, uh, um, the, the politics shows in, in, in England early this year. By, his name is Rutger Bregman. So he, um, he wrote a book, Utopia for Idiots, and this is the second book called Humankind, A Hopeful History. So here's the quote, and he's got in the very first, in the, chap in the very beginning of the book chapter, page two, he writes, this is a book about a radical idea. You know, I've, I've skipped a few lines. So what is this radical idea? That most people, 
deep down are pretty decent. And this is really the thesis of the book. I don't want to give away. It's a fantastic book, 400 page book, packed with great content, with interesting studies, with um, you know, some fresh takes on, thir- on, on certain topics. But the thesis overall is he wants to present and the, you know, he argues this is going against the popular sort of sentiment of our day is that he's, his, his opinion is that, and his argument is that people are decent. People are good. We are inherently good people. And he certainly sets up from a philosophical stance, um, the book in, 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 in page 43, 44, I've got here. He says, are we human, in other words, more inclined to be good or evil? He says it's really the opinion of Hobbes and Rousseau. So he says these two never met. By the time Rousseau was born, Hobbes has been dead 33 years. Nevertheless, they continue to be pitted against each other in the philosophical boxing ring. In one corner is Hobbes, the pessimist, sorry. The pessimist who would have, who would have us believe in the wickedness of human nature. The man who asserted that civil society alone could save us from our baser instincts. In the other corner is Rousseau. The man who declared that in our heart of hearts, we're all good. Far from being our salvation, who so believes civilization is what ruins us. Even if you've never heard of them, the opposing views of these two heavyweights are the root of society's deepest ramific- uh, deepest divides. I know, of, I know of no other debate mistakes as high or ramifications as far reaching. Harsher punishments versus better social services. Now he's listing depending if you take a Rousseau view of the world, that human beings are inherently good, really left to our base nature, left to our own devices, humans will be good. The argument is that civilization and what, you know, what created as a, as a, as a modern civilization and with all its, uh, all its infrastructure and restrictions on the human beings is actually what's decaying us. That's, and, and on the other hand, you've got Hobbes, Hobbes is in a famous line, that, um, you know, if every man would be left to their own, it'd be anarchy and it'd be a brutish and short and, and, and nasty and nasty life. Hobbes was of the opinion that human nature is obviously inherently bad. Um, humans are left to their own devices and, you know, without uh, strict authority would, would run ruin and, 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 and create a, a nasty society. So this is, again, from his philosophical, from an early modern philosophical uh, standpoint. These are these two opinions and it really trickles down and he says even in modern political policies, it's going to, the different schools of thoughts are going to affect how, how you implement different policies, whether it be to do with social services, school reform, um, top-down management versus empowered teams, uh, various different things. This comes down to the Hobbes or Rousseau, Rousseau view of the world. Coming back to the Jewish also. So obviously this is a topic, this is a massive topic, a fundamental topic. I just want to scratch the surface and share with you some uh, basic Jewish sources and um, to see, see what uh, the, our Torah sources have to offer and um, see, see what comes out, uh, see what we come out with. So the verse in Tehillim, we have a, near the beginning of Tehillim, chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, tell us as follows. What is man that you are mindful of him? So this, is, this Tehillim is talking about the grandeur of God. So saying in relation to God, man, is, man, is, man seems to be a minuscule, nothing. But, God, what is man to you that you that you should be mindful of him? You know, the son, mortal man that you take note of him. But rather, you have made him a little less than the divine. And you have adorned him with glory and with majesty. What's clear is King David's describing man as nothing less than on the simple understanding of the verse, that man is but a little less than God. We are mini gods, or you know, God minus one. You know, we're, we're basically we're basically like God. There are other interpretations that understand here the word Elohim not as God but as angels. Um, but still, to say we are some type of exalted, godly, inherently good. Um, divine type of a uh, type of being. That's what these verses in Tehillim, as against our Gemara we shared earlier on, the Gemara and Eruvin denotes that a man had not been created because seemingly we ain't too good. Here we seem to be saying quite the opposite that we're only a little less than God. If God is obviously the ultimate good, is pure goodness, then man maybe we're not pure goodness, but we we we, for, we surely are pretty good. Um, as it is. So we have seemed to be two poles. Man is good, this verse in Tehillim. Man is inherently good, he's basically 
like God, as good as God is. And the other pole is the Gemara and Erevin, better man not being created. Seemingly, the understanding would be because man is not good. Man is destined, you know, without a great struggle, destined and, and nearly sure to, to end up bad. And then I think you have the middle path. I think it's just more the classical Jewish understanding. And not, I don't think I'm not sharing any great um, uh, novelties here, but this is the Rambam and Hilfus Teshuvah. Again, apropos of this time of year, these 10 days between uh, Rosh, spanning Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, there's 10 chapters of the Rambam in his Laws of Repentance. Many have the custom to study one of these chapters each day, really some of the most powerful passages in the Rambam's the Mishnah Torah in the, in the expanse of his great work. And he has here the chapter five, three chapters, five, six, and seven deal with free will. This is theology where he puts um, where he puts free will. I already mentioned this on Rosh Hashanah, that obviously free will and repentance are interlinked, um, dependent upon one or the other. So it makes sense that Rambam, Rambam places it here. Rambam writes, Rishus l'chol adam nasuna. Every person, he's right, adam here, but it really means every person, is endowed with free will. If someone wants to, literally, lahatos is to turn, is to pivot himself on the good path, and to be a righteous person, or it should be Adam. The permission is his. The, you know, he's granted the leeway to do that. And conversely, if he wants to turn himself away to the evil path, and to be a wicked person, or it should be Adam. Permission is granted. Who should cast about Torah? That is what the Torah tells us in Bereshit around, this is the chapter that deals with the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, which we'll come back to very soon. And they eat from the tree of knowledge. And what happens when they eat from the eight Hadas Tovah, or the tree of good, knowledge of good and bad? Suddenly man becomes like one of us, i.e. like the... Meaning what? Meaning we have the choice, we have the knowledge, we have the ability to turn either way, to turn towards the good or to turn towards the bad. This species called man, called human being, he is singular in the world. No other species, no other animals, no other living creatures are like us. In this matter, meaning in many ways we share many characteristics with animals you know, as living organisms. However, in this manner, we are completely unique. That he, from his own knowledge and his own thoughts, in the recess of his own consciousness, he knows good and evil, meaning he can discern between good and evil. And therefore, and he's free. And we are free, man is free. Human being is free to act on this knowledge, on these knowledge, these knowledges of good and evil. And to act accordingly. The Amy Shiyaki Biodo, and always forcing us in either way. Inherently, we're free to choose. Okay, then, then the, it goes back to the, to the topic there in, in, in Bereshit. So, for is telling us, man has, humankind has absolute, the human being has absolute free will, absolute free choice, meaning we're neither. Seemingly, this seems to denote if we have free choice, we can neither be inherently good or inherently bad. Meaning, we're not tilted to either direction. We're not, you know, engineered. We're not hardwired to be altruistic, to be good. Neither are we hardwired to be despotic, to be bad, to be cruel. We're bang in the middle. We are neutral, absolutely value neutral. We can choose either way. And then Ramban goes on. Ali He really pushes this point. Home. Don't think. The fools of the world say, even those unthinking people, that somehow there's predeterminism. That when we are created, God has chosen our life path. Don't think that you are you're destined to be good and this person's destined to be evil. That's not so. This is the, ex the extent of the stakes we're talking about. Each individual can be as great as Moshe, can be as righteous as Moshe, Moses, our teacher, or Rosh Kiyoravim, or can be as wicked as King Jeroboam, or he can be wise, or can be foolish, or Rachman, or Chazori, someone can be merciful, can be um, a compassionate person, or he can be a cruel person, or Kine Yoshua, someone can be someone who is 
um, is, is, gives away a lot of their money, or he's tight fisted. There's all types of deals, either character traits or mindsets. It's open. A person can choose which way to go. The no one can force a person, no one can creed upon a person. It's so no one's pulling him along either direction, meaning obviously external. There can be external factors. I can put a gun to your head and the balance isn't equal. But all things being equal, with no one else involved, nothing else involved, you can maybe say nurture is involved here. But I guess Ramam is saying naturally. A person's born, these, nothing's pinging him intrinsically to be a certain, a certain way. That's what Yirmiya says in Eicha. Jeremiah the prophet says, from the mouth of the of God, from the earlier, from the on high, even good and evil does not go out. Kolema, what does that mean? And this is a difficult verse to understand, but the Rambam here is interpreting it as follows. That God, the creator, doesn't decree on a person to be either good or to be either either bad. So again, the and then the Rambam to uh, let's go to the last line. Since we have the power in our hand, we have permission, we have the license to choose. And therefore, any evil we do, any wrongdoings we do, we can't outsource it, we can't blame it on an external force, an external person, an external reason, but it's rather we are responsible for it. Therefore, it demands of us to do repentance. Therefore, we can forsake, we can let go of the wickedness because we're never locked in. This isn't what the Rambam's adding here. We, not only do we have a choice at one point in life, we continually have a choice. It doesn't mean that the choices at certain ways can't get harder. And we'll come back to this and we'll see later sources. Perhaps we can entrench in ourselves into certain behaviors and we can lead ourselves down certain paths that does make certain behavior more inevitable, maybe bad habits more inevitable and good therefore behavior less less practicable nonetheless we have constantly have a choice and therefore repentance is not only av- available it's it's also obliged on us who should cost akhrav that's the verse in echa because because god doesn't decree for us to be good or bad therefore two verses later it can tell us we have to search out our ways we have to make an evaluation a searching and hopefully return to God again very pertinent as we approach Yom Kippur the day of atonement a day this heightened day these 10 days of repentance the idea this notion that we as from Rambo's perspective not inherently good and not inherently bad we are bang in the middle we really have complete and utter free choice we can choose to go either way. And therefore, um, we are responsible for the actions we do in either direction. And if we have done or chosen to go in the wrong direction, now this is the opportunity to backtrack, to repair, and to return and repent um, from that. Okay, that's the Rambam's opinion. Rambam's bang in the middle. Now what I want to now present are two verses in Voracious, one at the end of Parashat Voracious, chapter 6, verse 5 in in Genesis, and the next one we'll see in a few moments' time is in Noah after the flood. And these two verses present us with a problem um, on the on this on uh, on this thesis. Again, the verse in in Tehillim, we we're just less than God. We're we, you know it makes sense. We we we're invested with this divine soul. Um, God um, puts Adam. We'll, we'll come to this more 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 in detail soon. God puts, puts Adam into the world, uh, seemingly to do good in the world, to be a force for good, not to destroy the world, he even commands Adam. You know, the Avdor, the Shomra, protect the world. God seemingly gives Adam the tools and the nature, at least, um, to, to do that, to be a force for good in the world. Then we saw the Rambam, if not, if, if you know, our job is to be a good, to do good in the world, but God wants us to choose to do that. So we're 50 50 here. Hasn't, he hasn't skewed it against us. He hasn't, you know, betted against us if he's, you know, by, by making us, in, in, you know, inherently bad. But then we have this verse. After creation of man and the banishment from the, from the Garden of Eden and Cain kills Hell his brother, then we have the end of the passage of Horatius. God sees 
that evil and where man's wickedness has become great on the earth, has um, proliferated everywhere. And then the verse tells us, and that's, okay, that's a statement of fact. You know, the society had become a, a decayed one. The society had become a rotten one. But then the verse tells us something else. The whole It's a bit difficult to translate, but the whole So yetsa we understand usually as an inclination. You know, we talk about the yetsa hatov, yetsa hara. Somehow the drives within us, the um, um, the the yates are within us. Machshavos libo, the thoughts of one's heart are rap prakalayom, only evil all day. So on the face of it, this seems to be saying God is making an assessment of um, mankind as he's uh, after he's creating the world, and he's saying, you know what? Actually, man is bechodiyes and machshavos libo rap prakalayom. Seemingly, man is inherently bad. You know, the world has become a wicked place because man's thoughts, man's inner world, man's life, you know, the life, the apes and the, his drives are rock rock, so like all day are, are evil. So we're going to have to grapple what, what, what exactly is this verse telling us and is it shedding light on the inherent nature of, 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 of humankind, of the human being, or is it actually telling us something 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 different again if there's any questions comments um either in the chat i'm not really checking the chat or in the in person you know unmute yourself and feel free feel free to chime in and to have your say or to, to pose a question so the rav yosef dov soloveitchik was the base halevi so he was the founder of the brisk dynasty he lived in the early part of the 19th century in um in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, he was um, amongst the founders of the Veloz and Yeshiva. He's, his, his son was Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, and his grandson was Rav Moshe Soloveitchik, and his, grand, his son, named after this person, Rav Yosef Soloveitchik, was Rav Joseph B. Soloveitchik of, uh, of American Jewry in the 20th century. So in the, is a classic work of the Veis Halevi, essays on the Chumash, so he writes on this verse as follows. So he's actually coming, this is in the middle of a piece. So he's, he's coming off the back, he's quoting from a, a, a medrash, and he's telling us that this medrash is teaching us about the ways of the evil inclination, the Yitzhara Pituyot, the Kocha Shalavera, its tactics and the strength and the power of sin. Idea that sin isn't value neutral, obviously not, but sin also isn't isn't isolated, isn't an isolated act. Sin has a, an effect. It, uh, it pollutes the heart of a person. So as a general parable to the evil inclinations, to the effects it has on the human, human nature, we'll take the harlot, the prostitute, as an example. Why? Since it's a, a low, disgusting type of act, behavior, and everyone recognizes it, that it's obviously not something uh, laudable. The fact that it's not something commendable, that it's not something nice, there's something somewhat depraved, everyone's going to agree. The harlotry, that prostitution is not something which is nice. The He says, even the harlot herself, if you ask the prostitute about what she's doing, she'll admit and she'll tell you that it's not a very pleasant and not a very nice thing. She only does it for the money. She's in there because she has no other choice. No, no, this is not a no, not passing judgment on prostitution, legal, not legal, and then the state and everything like that. But he's, 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 he's saying this from a philosophical point of view. It, you know, most prostitutes will sell you, I'm in the business for the money. Meaning, there was no money, she herself would not be interested in it. So he makes a fascinating point. The Beis lady says that, you know what, the want to gain money, the want to make a living is not itself a bad thing. Each one of us is making a living, is in this world going about our business, trying to make ends meet, trying to make a living. That itself not only is it a, not a negative thing, it's definitely it could be a neutral thing, but it could even be a good thing. God has commanded us to, 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 to make a living after the Shomra to, 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 to work the world and to, to, to extract a way of sustaining ourselves. Our 
Aber ich kann es aber ich so war ruhig, ich nicht da bin. Ich bin in The end purpose, taking again the, 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 the prostitute as an example. He's saying the end purpose in itself is not a bad thing. In this case, it's only the means, it's only the process of, of doing so which is, which, is, which is negative. But then he says something happens. You can't ignore the process, you can't ignore the intermediary, you can't ignore the way in order to get to the, in order to get to the end. That's all that at first, where the, the act, the behavior hasn't had an effect, hasn't rubbed onto the individual. At that point, the evil inclination, the, I don't want to give it the Christian, you know, imagery of the voice within us, but, the, you know, however you understand it, there's many different ways of, 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 of understanding this, or the, what they're giving the metaphors, but the more physical side of ourselves, but the, 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 the bodily side of ourselves, the, the more base element of our human um, identity, needs to, and what, that wants us to behave in more base ways, needs to get us to behave in that way from an, in, 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 from an external source. However, once we become accustomed to a type of immoral behavior, a type of base act, that sin, that behavior has an effect on us. And that is Kishura Vokikele, Ashallah, Ashad Esm Shamay Savira Zuhu, Zuhi Latach is Hamavukashla. In the end, it's no longer about doing this sin or doing this behavior as a means to get to an end. And I'm, I'm not going to read it inside, but you know, as he goes on to explain, at some point, the prostitute doesn't necessarily just do prostitution for the sake of the money. When she starts, that's her purpose. She starts out to do it to get the money. But somehow the behavior itself has an effect on her. And it, let's take it away from the prostitution, it could be anything. Um, and any other type of, of, of negative or immoral based behavior. At some point, we, at the beginning, we, 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 we legitimize it away because we're trying to get something. We're, we're even a legitimate end. We're trying to achieve something which could even be legitimate. But over time, as that behavior becomes more ingrained, as that behavior itself becomes attractive, as that behavior uh, it, it, it has an effect on our persona, we stop even bothering, and we stop thinking about what it's bringing us, the end, the, 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 the purpose of the behavior, the behavior itself, the negative behavior itself becomes the end, that becomes, that becomes, that becomes the purpose. So he's, that's what he's saying, what, what the Torah is telling us in this verse over here. God Don't think that human beings are inherently evil. That's not what it's telling us. It's telling us that we have the ability we have the ability, if that is where our mind is, and that is where our, our behavior has led us to, that is where we've conditioned ourselves to be, indeed, we can get to a stage where we, it looks, on our, for all intents and purposes, it looks like we're inherently evil. It looks like we're bound and we're, we're caught up in this, in this negative and immoral behavior with no errors. It looks as if it's our second nature. That's because we've, used our free will and got ourselves down to, uh, down the path that we're now indistinguishable. We're metantim halev. You know, that's more of a Kabbalistic, I guess, spiritual terminology. But, uh, and I don't want to translate it necessarily into, like, um, you know, into, into um, psychological uh, um, terminology. But metantim halev, the blocking up of the spiritual heart, it means we've, I guess, conditioned ourselves in a certain way. We've, um, covered over the purity of our soul so much that it's seemingly the goodness, the, the purity within us, the force for good is, 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 is totally obscurated and it looks and it seems like the person is, 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 is trapped in, 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 in an evil loop, in, 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 in negative behavior, but that indeed isn't, isn't, isn't the truth. The Malbu makes an interesting point here on this, on this, on this verse. He writes as follows, God saw that man Kind has been bad, man, all he does is evil. So first, it's interesting. This is what the Malbu telling us based on the Midrashic um, literature, that God decides at this point to shorten the length that humans live, right? If you read in Parashat Barashas, you know, human beings were living for hundreds of years, six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years. Then you see steadily that uh, the, the, the lifespan got shorter and shorter. So Malbu, based on the Midrash explains, because God thought perhaps a little bit we could use the Beis HaLevi's understanding is the more evil a 
person does or people do as society do, the more they become entrenched in it. Then it's, it's really, it's the, the longer the time process, the deeper and deeper they get it. So maybe if you shorten man's life, you shorten the length that a human being lives, they'll have less time to entrench these immoral and negative behavior. We saw that didn't work. He just saw that he, man's evil behavior, even nature even, or oh, let's call it evil nurture, was, um, was just increasing. So he makes an interesting distinction. Someone who sins, negative behavior, sin, morality, that comes from a place of taiva, of longing, of desire, physical desire, there is a hope that you can stop doing that thing. You can stop behaving in that way. Why? When you desist or you no longer have a urge for that specific thing. Or you, your time frame, your, time, your stage in life changes, your situation in life changes, and that thing no longer becomes appealing. People who have become wicked for this, in this way, they can have regret and they can redeem themselves, so to speak, and they can pull back from that behavior. He says it would be different if it comes from a philosophical viewpoint, from a theological standpoint. Meaning if the immoral behavior, if the immoral mindset, if the, if the character trait is not something which is being driven by an urge, by a desire, but it's coming from something deeper, it's coming from a a, a, a value judgment is coming from a theology that is more difficult. That become can become that can become more more, more entrenched. That's possibly here the man is starting to make a, a a distinction when he's saying when it comes to when it comes to a, a behavior regarding um, um, a, a negative and moral behavior regarding our urges. That clearly man isn't you know humankind isn't inherently bad. Like, can we make ourselves inherently bad and can it stretch across generations? It's not to do with, it's not to do, I guess, with the, with the physical urges, but to do with a theology, to do with a, 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 a value judgment. Then he's saying, possibly, possibly you can switch over. You can go into, into that inherently um, bad. Reduk, um, he quite right, writes quite specifically. Right, okay. What does it mean? The key, the key word in this post, and I already alluded to it before, is this extra addition. He doesn't say, As if inherent, man's heart, the thoughts of man's heart are evil. He says, There's something else at play here. There's something else that's impinging and that's influencing the evil doings. That's why he's right. So he said, so that we indeed do have, we're not, the neutrality, the balance, the equilibrium is not there's nothing there, but rather we are balancing between these two inclinations, between these two drives, between these two sides of us, an evil side and a good side. He said, in these people, in that time, they were all evil. The good in them has somehow become diminished. That's what's called the desire of the thoughts of the heart, Yetzer. So again, it seems to be what the Radak is telling us, man, like the Rambam, man isn't inherently good or bad. He has these two possibilities with him. He has these two drives, these two sides of him. And they, again, exercising like muscles, exercising one more than the other, you can, you can strengthen one and, and, we can, and we can the other. And that was what was at that time impinging impinging their behavior. Okay, that's one verse. I said we come to a second verse, which is after the flood. So God has destroyed the world. He's brought a flood. He's wiped out um, humankind, saved Noah and his family. And he promises, I'm never going to bring another flood. What's fascinating here is the reason for the first flood, as we just saw, was the verse that God sees mankind, he sees humankind, and he sees they're evil. They're terrible. They're, they're, all they do is bad. All they do, you know, they seem to be evil beings. And now God says, Noach brings a sacrifice, and God smells the sweet smell of the sacrifice. God says unto his heart, um, we won't go into what exactly that means. God says, I'm never going to curse the earth again. Because of man's behavior, because of um, humankind's behavior. Why? Sorry. 
Um, Why am I not going to destroy the world? Because, again, since the devisings of man's heart are evil from his youth. I'm not going to any more destroy the, all the creatures that I have created. Again, interesting question, not for now. What seems to be, although there is a distinction, you'll notice one is, we saw before, one is, the devisings of man's thoughts are only evil all day. And here we have them that they are ram in the ura. They are evil from uh, one's youth. But again, it seems to be saying a similar type of point. This idea that Yetzel lay for Adam, that the heart of a person is engineered. Yetzel, the, the drive is ram in the ura, is evil from his, from, from his youth. And again, denoting, seems to be on a, on a simple level, that human beings are evil. And we can't, we, we, it's an inescapable reality. From my own ura, from our youngest age, from the day we're born, Leave Adam Rab, the, the heart of a person, i.e., the seats of their motion, the seats of their, uh, you know, the moral, uh, the moral compass is evil. It's it, it, it's sad we understand that. So the Arachayim was a um, commentator on the Chumash, a more from a more kabbalistic um, uh, um, viewpoint. He uses the an interesting Gemara Baba Kama. Let's read it in English. In English. For the inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth. This statement is best understood as similar to the Talmud of Avakama. The Talmud discusses an incident in which a bull trained to perform in an arena has gored someone. So again, not, I guess, maybe we, the self-driving car that, um, that knocks someone over. Oh, okay, well, let's call it, you know, the animal that got ahead and gored someone. It's not the same because an animal can act on their own volition and uh, it was a, 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 it's not a topic, but say a program card does unless I, AI gets that in us to a place where it can. So the, um, such an animal is not subject to the death penalty as it only did it, what, what it, only did what it was expected to do. There's, the reason cited in the mission is that the Torah uses the future tense, yigach, in the word in Exodus 21, 28, when providing the death penalty for an oxen which go to human beings. Animals which have been trained to do just that are not culpable for doing what comes naturally. Okay, so what's the case here? The case is an arena. Basically, you have, I don't know if anyone's been in Spain, you have bullfighting. They have trained bulls which are, are trained to go ahead and gore somebody. So let's say you have an animal you've trained to gore a human being. So generally, we would say an animal that gores a human being is put to death. But such an animal that's been trained to do this, it programmed to kill, that, it, 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 that's, that's what it does, meaning it, 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 how can the animal be culpable for killing the human being if that's what it's been trained, that's what it's been programmed, programmed to do. Similarly, man, equipped as he is with an evil instinct from birth, is not culpable until he has learned to distinguish right from wrong. Seemingly, our evil inclination, our evil instinct is there from the moment we're born. But it's only as we mature, it's only as we gain moral knowledge and moral understanding that we can learn to distinguish right from wrong. This rule applies to mind as not being subject to the judiciary process. That is why in, Jew, in, in, in halakha, so do in, 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 in most secular systems of law, a child is not culpable for their actions. Why not? Because seemingly we have an instinct to do, to be violent, to do nasty things, to perpetrate terrible things. And as, to, till a certain point, the person is not able so doesn't have the, the, the intelligence or the moral, the moral awareness to know that this is not the right thing to do and, and to be able to control those, those impulses. That's why they are, however, punishable by God for not having heeded his call. Meaning, as adults, you know, oh, sorry, as a child, in that respect, man is not like the bull we mentioned. Meaning, man, is that now he's making distinctions. We're not programmed completely to do evil. We may have within us an instinct to do evil, but we also have the command, we also have the instruction, we also have a program of what to do that which is right. Man's advantage over the beast is his knowledge of good and evil. We have knowledge. He's charged with despising evil and choosing what is good, of choosing that which is right even over our base instinct. The fact that man was born with the Yitzhahara only acts like an extenuating circumstance and pr protecting him against God's anger. Nonetheless, Dora Chaim seems to say, at least to a certain point in our life, maybe throughout our lives, we have an instinct for evil, but the instinct for good is not necessarily as a powerful instinct. 
that needs us to implement it. The instinct for good and evil is there, is automatic, so to speak. The instinct for good is something we have to be, which has, has to be a learned knowledge. It has to be a learned instinct. It has to be something we, we inculcate. Okay. So on this same verse, Shaddal, um, um, who was an interesting, uh, we're not going to go into him, but interesting um, 19th, 18th century um, modern Jewish thinker. He writes in the underline, it doesn't say that the heart of the, of the human being is, is wicked in nature. But rather his thoughts are evil from the time of his youth. He's coming back to the Ramba middle of, middle, you know, this middle position that, you know, we're not saying, the verse is not teaching us that, you know, Somehow we're inherently in, in a program to be evil from the moment we're born. And maybe Arachim was suggesting that good, that moral behavior is something that has to be learned later. He's saying really it's not, it's not instinctive. It's like, again, evil is also something which is learned. Evil is something also which is implemented. Rather, it's not something which is not, it's not a natural forced insti- instinct um, within, within the person. Interesting, um, on this Nu'ura, this distinction, because we said the verse here in Noah, Pasha Noah, after the flood, says about man's instincts, um, the visings of man having being evil from his youth, where in Bereisha it just said, Rak Rakalayo. So on this Nu'ura, from his youth, from Shom Shom Fal Hash, an interesting take on this idea of youth. And he says, really, the word Na'ar really comes to the word to shake off. Hula Na'ar, O La Hashtich Me Allah Dovama. It means to throw off something. And he says, basically, youth is a time, a very modern understanding, youth is a time of experimenting and then throwing off that experimental behavior. He's saying, really, things come from without, from without the person. Influences, whether good or bad, come from, from outside the human being. And nothing really sticks in a fixed way. The, 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 the nature of the child is to be in his, in his, in his primal um, 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 nature. He doesn't really choose one that they have the other. Okay, this is how we understand this verse. I mean, it's interesting uh, as a side point. This idea that the youth, those who youth, um, 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 goes to their youthful years, throwing off different identities, experimenting with certain things, whether they be good or they're bad, and then throwing them off, eventually molding the type of personality. Um, as I see, you know, young people, and they're neither righteous, nor are they, nor are they wicked. Woe to the person who thinks we're wicked in nature. So again, Rosh Hashanah is moving away from understanding this verse as telling us in any way that some that human beings are indeed inherently bad, are inherently programmed to be to be bad. He said we don't have such an instinct, we don't have such a such a such a nature. Okay, moving into the last into the last part, we move into a understanding of perhaps there was a change, a switch from the way God created Adam and Eve originally until after the sin of the of the eating from the tree of knowledge. And perhaps there is a slight difference on the, nat- on the nature of, 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 of the human being and this balance between inherently good and inherently bad um, in those two stages of, 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 of our early history. So, Vayivra of Salmo, it says there in Bereshit, in the beginning of Bereshit, that God, Vayivra, created the human being, Bitsalmo, in his image. The Amira, so what's interesting, Hiskira Kosa Loshan Nasa, when God talks about creating human beings, he uses the expression of na'ase, let us make, again, the, the, the plural is an interesting point, na'ase, let us make, um, let us make man. The Loshan Bria, when it comes to actually creating human being, it talks about Bria fashioning, creating, that's a little bit about Asiya making, Bria, Asiya and Bria are two, we use them synonymously, you know, to make and to do, but they are two different distinct, distinct words. Because he says, well, the, the, the idea of, um, the idea of um, um, 
Okay, yeah. Also, when it comes to when God creates man, by Yivro B'Tzalmo, God creates man in his image, it doesn't talk about Demus. It talks about Tzalmo, the image of God, it doesn't talk about Demus, the appearance of God. That only comes after the story of the tree of uh, good and evil. There, it says, Demus Echot, so in one image, in one, in one liking he made him. And early, it appears to me, this is a radical point. God had intended that the wholeness, the completion of the, of, of the human being, the shlemus, his, 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 his wholesomeness, his completeness, will be dependent on him. That man, so to speak, has to finish himself. God doesn't really define our nature. But we, so to speak, choose our nature, our natural state. So this is what he says, and, and, and we'll see how Rambam formulates it. He says, before the sin of eating from the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, Adam and Eve were really in their nature like the angels on high. That they would do the will of God, that's what they're programmed. They're programmed just to do the will of God. And really, there wasn't true free will at that first instance. That which, that which, and this is a bit of a, 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 a difficult point, that which man uh, made himself like God, he was similar to God, was through how he completed himself. Okay, he goes on to explain, we don't have time to go through this whole thing. And he says like this, Now we can understand how we started this, the, the, that passage in the Talmud and Erevin, that they decided it was better for man not to have been created than being created. Shoot from what? That's an amazing statement. It's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dumbfounding statement. Why? How can the rabbis in the Talmud come along and say, God, you created mankind, you created the human being. That was the pinnacle of creation. You did a terrible job. Better how you not done it. And more than that, if you're telling me man, which is the pinnacle of creation, the human being, which sits at the apex of everything that God created, was, shouldn't have been created. Therefore, creation as a whole, by extension, should not have been created. Better had there been no existence. Better had there been no world, be no universe. How can we say such a thing? What we're saying is that's not true. We're not saying it has been better that man had not been made. But rather, there's something wrong with the briyosa. A man made himself. Because at the beginning, the way God created us, we weren't, we were programmed, we were inherently good. Somehow we were, we were inherently good, we were on the right track, we would have been inherently in, well, le leading the world to the right destination. God creates us, God created the human being inherently good. But he gave us some level of choice, it was a different type of choice that we have. And even so, Adam and Eve managed to use that choice that they had, and they sinned. And once they had chosen, so to speak, in that choice, choice to eat from the tree of knowledge, they finished the programming. That's what he's saying here. God created us programmed to be good, but we gave us the option to choose still. And we chose to eat, we chose to defy him, we chose this, the, the, the tree of knowledge, evil and good, which pivoted us in the other direction. It pivoted us away from being inherently good to somehow being either neutral or maybe possibly inherently bad. He's actually saying that and, and it pivoted us to be inherently neutral, but since it being inherently neutral is a very hard thing. Once we're neutral, most people choose the bad. Once it's 50-50, for whatever reason, most people find it hard to, 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 to improve themselves, to better themselves, to be the 
the, 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 the good person and we end up being, that's why the statement can be, it's not a bad reflection, it's not a reflection on God's creation, but rather a reflection on our choices, both our Adam and Eve, and then our choices more, more generally. We don't have the, with the Rambam says a similar, a similar thing, it's an important, important chapter in the Guide for the Perplexed, where he says Adam and Eve before the sin of the, of the tree of knowledge, um, or the tree of Eitz Hadas Tovara, they had their choice which was between false, between uh, true, true and false. After the eighth, it became good and bad. We went from being object to subject, we really didn't have the time, I see the time has flown by, but um, again, the similar distinction, God creates us one way, perhaps inherently good, after the choice of Adam and, uh, Adam and Eve, perhaps we, we moved to either being neutral or possibly even the option to be uh, possibly. Let me just conclude with a comment by Rav Yitzchak Kutna. Rav Yitzchak Kutna, in the Pachay, in his book on Rosh Hashanah, writes as follows. He writes that, Matam um, Lukishan is boya. Dim Hoyu, sorry, I just can't read it, oh sorry. Um, the Im, yeah, the Im Hoyu Koyches Hatova Rashi Kulim. He says, if the forces, the, na- the natural forces within us for good and evil were equal, Loi Hoyu Ashi Lali Tshua Tshot Tertoa. Repentance wouldn't have been possible. We don't have time to go into explaining um, where he's coming from. I'm skipping a few lines. The whole possibility of repentance. He says in the, four, in the fight of choice between good and evil, he says the forces are not equal. There is an inkling towards the good. Now he qualifies and explains as follows. He says, most things in life are possible. Most eventualities in life, most realities are true because there's a possi- they're because they, they are possible. Meaning, it's possible for us to do X and therefore X becomes a reality when we choose to do it. He says, repentance is a possibility in the reverse. It's possibility because it's in actuality. He's basing himself on the, tar- the Talmud tells us that God promises that in the end of days, we will do repentance. Before the coming of Mashiach, the Jewish people will indeed repent, meaning it's a reality. It is a given. And because it's a given, this is the thesis of this particular chapter, because it's a given, it's a reality, it becomes a possibility. Not our topic tonight, but this is how he understands repentance. It's a difficult topic. How can we change the past? What does it mean to to repent, to return, to change, to, to undo the past? But... In, in, in a nutshell, he is saying because it's a, it's a reality, God has built it in, God has promised it, that at the end of the day, at some point, there is going to be repentance. Mankind, Jewish people are going to do repentance, therefore it becomes a possibility retrospectively. And that's what he's saying here, the Yishachro that indeed, when, and this is in the realm of repentance, we aren't exactly programmed equally 50-50. There is something that is nudging it towards, 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 towards the good. And we don't have time to go into the last source, but hopefully what, um, what we've seen is a survey of some sources, um, starting from our Gemara, which we, we have in the liturgy on Yom Kippur, this idea that being better, we've not been created, seemingly denoting that we are programmed to be evil, we're programmed to be bad, we, 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 we're destined to fail, to the Verse into here and telling us that we're just a little less good than God, we're, we're angelic beings. And then these two verses, which we discussed at length in Bereshit Tanakh, seemingly to denote that God destroy, brings a flood, and the promise is not to bring a flood because we are inherently evil. Somewhere we are inherently evil, that we only do good. And we explain the various explanations that either they're not talking about inherent evil, it's somehow that we've in effect, that we, through our behavior, through our learned behavior, have, have, have chosen that, um, or, or that it's, a, or that it's a, a predicament of a certain stage in life, but not, not of, of, of later life. Um, and then we saw the Kassadva Kabbalah and the Rambam, that perhaps we're talking about human beings were inherently good when it came to Adam and Eve, and Eve but through eating through the choice of eating through the, um, from the Eitz HaDas Tovarah, from the Tree of Knowledge, that we moved away from being inherently good to either being neutral or possibly even being slanted and, and destined to fail more than we, more than we succeed. I'm going to stop the recording here.
and um, anyone who got any questions. Otherwise, it's uh, really been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining.